back. You are watching and listening to Breakfast with Stephen and Ellie. Let's have a look at the newspapers for you. Start with the Times. It says nursing unions are set to reject a final pay offer from the government in a move that could lead to another wave of strikes across the NHS. The Telegraph leads with a report about deaths supposedly rising in the two weeks during and after the first round of industrial action by junior doctors last month. Uh, on to the eye, it says tens of thousands of families are reportedly fighting to unlock trust funds set up for their children. The Daily Express claims that Prince Harry's visit to Britain for the coronation will leave no time for him to mend fences with the royal family. Senior members of the Conservative Party are turning against the Home Secretary, according to The Guardian. The Mirror leads on the news that a convicted rapist has been given access to £7.2 million lotto jackpot that he won in 2004 after a lengthy legal battle. The Sun has news that Fergie has not been invited to the coronation. Forget it. The Daily Star reports that the price of deodorants is heading for £5.00. A can, yes, <laughs> ringing, ringing, ringing in fears of what the paper describes as a pandemic. So don't moan if I come in slightly whiffy one day. You could never. No. He always smells good, this one. No. It's pricey though, five pounds a, a can. It's yeah. expensive. I don't pay five pounds a can. No, do I. But I do scour the, I do, there's always an offer on. Ball you know. variety. The what? Ball variety. No. No, I don't it's like... The, it's the dirty seaside pause. It is, yes, I know. Oh, I'm yes. I won't repeat. No, thank you. No, as you can see, uh, filthy Liz Kershaw and senior reporter at the Eye, Benjamin <laughs> Butterworth, are here. She's always got the lewd seaside postcard jokes. Um, anyway, let's kick off Liz with actually a serious story in The Times. Um, thousands waiting, so it claims, for about 12 hours in A&E. No, no, one in ten wait at least 12 hours. So well, that adds up to I'm thousands. Not. Yeah, about 4,500 in size. And um, any waiting times have deteriorated over the past year with analysis, this is a scary bit, suggesting that these delays, so you take a loved one, or you, it's you, and you, got, you present yourself at a and &E, and you can feel yourself deteriorating, mm. and you're waiting up maybe over 12 hours, and this is now causing... Up to, how can we say this in a civilised country? Over 500, up to, sorry, up to 500 avoidable deaths each week. And we have heard stories, haven't we, reported. Of if you're deteriorating in A&E, though, there should be, they should, I mean, the people, you're not on your own. The people there see you. Um, I think you're all right if you've got an advocate with you, because in the case of my son... Um, he'd had nothing to eat or drink for two or three days because his throat had closed up, mm. couldn't see a doctor. And in the end, they, when we rang, they just said, oh, take him to A&E. And he's six foot six, and he hadn't had any liquids. That's the, that's, he can survive without food, but no. Mm. And I was petrified. And we waited and waited and waited, and then he was allowed to lie down, and we waited... And it was only because I kicked off. He was totally unable to do that. Yeah. That we finally, this sister grudgingly said, oh, I'll take him up to... Uh, and she put him in a wheelchair. And, and then he was plugged into all these drips. And God knows what would have happened. But mm. you, uh, if you're on your own, then I think it must be terrifying. Or if you're there and you just aren't, as, should we call myself, assertive? Mm. You aren't assertive. Uh, um, and you don't have to be rude. Mm or violent, uh, you know, you can just be assertive. But if you haven't got somebody there, yeah. people are actually dying. And, it's, and, it, and it is just absolutely terrifying. It's not right. They need to, they, we, we all know it's to do with bed blocking, which is a horrible term. But they need to be able to get people out and put them in convalescent homes if necessary. But get, actually get, get that flow through, then people can get through A&E. &E it's simpler than that because I've sat there and observed it. So when he was discharged, the mo it, it, then we, he was told at 9.30 in the morning, OK, son, you can go home. And he was there till 6.30 in the bed, sit, well, dressed with his backpack, lying on the bed because he made you stay there. till 6.30, waiting for the pharmacy to deliver the drugs that had been dispensed for him to take home to the ward. And as I sat there, I kept saying, well, can't I go down to the pharmacy? Oh, no, you're not allowed to do that. So you've got the pharmacy going round, oh, the whole huge hospital mm. taking packets of pills. So that's one bed. So I presume, because, so he was waiting when he, when he finally 
was told, yes, we're, we're admitting you. He was then waiting five hours to get into a bed mm. and get a drip in his arm. And presumably, when he was lying on the bed for eight hours, Someone's there was in somebody A&E. in a &E. So yeah. that, to me, that's a management issue. Why can't they look at it, the big picture, the logistics of it, and sort it out. I mean, on top of that, there are the elderly people who can't go home because they can't be left. Oh, yeah. But this this is, to me, a simple thing. Yeah, it is. There's loads of hoops to jump through, aren't yeah. there? You have to see somebody first who decides who you go on triage. to. Triage. Triage, that's it. And then triage decides who you go to. I mean, that, the wait for triage can be four or five hours. Yeah. Before, I mean, that, uh, it's maybe yeah. it's too simple, but when you get to reception, there should be someone there who says, right, this is where you go. We laughed at it at the time, but when we were students, donkeys years ago, somebody hit my brother over the head with a snooker cue, oh. and they scrapped his skin home, and he was, there was blood pouring down him, and we got to Leeds General Infirmary, and this woman goes, yeah, name. Um, she goes, and what's the problem? He goes, I sprained my ankle. Oh. <laughs> and, she just, and then she looked up at him, and she went, oh, my God. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, ben. What do you I was just going to say, if, if only we had more GPs yeah. and uh, better hours that people could access their GPs, I think you'd have far fewer people going into A&E because it's become the sort of first port of call for a lot of people into the NHS. You know, you have this 8am rush to try and get one of the few available slots first thing in the morning at your local surgery. Yeah. And then other people, because sometimes they have quite serious problems. You know, my now late grandmother, um, her health was deteriorating very suddenly and she was told of a three-week wait to go and see a GP so she'd suddenly become very disorientated she couldn't name day-to-day -day objects she couldn't dress herself practically overnight something had happened told the local surgery in Alderley Edge back in Cheshire they couldn't take her three weeks I'm sure that's because they don't have enough resource then she goes into A&E and, and thank God in that case because it, it turned out she would have a terminal brain tumour but what's shocking about that is that those symptoms were described and there was no access mm. to the GP. Yeah, I mean, well, that's, that's My son only ended up in A&E because for a week it was ringing the GP. Yeah. Couldn't he in. couldn't get to be seen. L at least A&E is mm. accessible. I mean, just this is, I mean, I, I mean, it's I, the only place you can get in. I had a problem with my eyes uh, a couple of years ago. And first of all, I went to an eye hospital and I learned that there is not a single overnight... Um, way to access an eye, eye hospital in England. So if you, for example, have a terrible accident no. where you harm your eye, nowhere overnight in England anymore. That's what they told me at um, Moorfields when I went there. Just shocking. And then, um, and then when I got to A&E, where I was for like 12 hours at Charing Cross Hospital, uh, the things you saw, the vomiting, there was someone who had a heart attack while they were in there. I mean, you know, full marks to the staff who actually have to deal with that because, you know, they get all and sundry, every condition imaginable, mm -hmm. plants themselves in those seats, and it, it must be hell at times. It's, it, the, the system is definitely broken. Yeah. There's, no, there's no getting over as much as we try and sugarcoat it. Yeah. Um, let's have a look, Benjamin, at The Guardian, should mm -hmm. we? And milk is dropping in price. Yes. So, I mean, we've had a year of everything rocketing. Apparently, milk has gone up in, by 31%, along with the cost of cheese and eggs. I mean, honestly, there's a meme that I see on the internet about chickens going round in Louis Vuitton outfits. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because the eggs are so expensive <laughs> right now. Well, it's turning around. Uh, Sainsbury's and Tesco have cut the price of milk by 5%. And actually, I was slightly concerned when I first read this because I thought, well, are, are the farmers doing OK? But it says that, you know, it's not been so bad in recent months. Apparently, there's a spring flush when all the cows are happy and they produce far more milk. Mm. Uh, and so it's OK for the farmers at the moment, relatively speaking. And I think this will be a relief to a lot of people because, you know, one thing about this country is that we've always had quite cheap food compared to America, for example, compared to many European countries, because we have such a competitive supermarket sector. Well, that's really gone in the other direction in the last six to 12 months. So I think... See, a cut in the cost of these basics will be a great relief. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it, it, it will. We just need it to happen with everything else as well, yeah. don't we? Yeah. Um, in the mirror, Liz, uh, President Biden is heading to Belina. Belina! <laughs> <laughs> You've got uh, stereo girls whose ancestors come from 
What's Where's it spelled Bal- Balina then? Well, anyway. It's Balinar. Balinar. In Mayo. It's Balinar, County Mayo. And oh. Biden has uh, found oh. out, traced back, that his um, <laughs> great, great, great grandfather came from Balinar. Oh, right. So the town is being treated to a state visit from the United States. Great, 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 great grandfather. Now, my great grandma came from Ballinar and I dug out a picture today of her mother. So my great great grandmother. Oh, they've got it. So I, I'm a bit worried we could be related. You could be related. I think you definitely are. I think you definitely are. I mean, look at the chin on that if you're listening on the radio. Yeah. So this is your great 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 grandma. Next to Catherine Joe Biden. Coleman taking in the doorway of her cottage in 1920. You see, now you've said it, there is a look between you and Biden. You cheeky sock is <laughs> Well, no, but that's... But just, a, you know, a similarity. Okay. I can't see it with you, Liz, but I can see it with your great no, And they've got the same sort of sloping eyebrows like Yeah, yeah like you. Anyway, they're more, inter- more interesting, like... So I'm terrified now. My cousin's going to dig back and... I, I could be having tea at the White House. Anyway, oh, oh, the, the, most, he'd be in for a treat. the most interesting story about Ballinar, and I doubt Biden knows this because he thought the black and tans were a rugby team. Right, yeah. And I know they yeah. weren't because <laughs> me, me, my great uncle Johnny was put against the wall and shot by the Brits, by the black and tans. Um, but anyway, so the, the, main, the fascinating thing is that in the Second World War, um, the D-Day landings, they were right to be scuppered by the weather. It was June, and late May, early June, and the weather was un- un- unseasonally stormy, and Eisenhower uh, needed a weather forecast. So this young girl from Ballinar put the place on the map, Maureen Sweeney, and she had to go out to Black Sod weather station, I didn't make that up, no. and she took all the readings of the transatlantic weather fronts coming in, and she went back to Ballinar post office yeah. and she relayed them by telegraph to, to Eisenhower, who then saw that, that Maureen had given him a window of opportunity that the weather on the 4th of June would be a lot calmer. It was still bad. Yeah. And so he made the decision. And that ho- is why the D-Day landings happened on that day. I hope she got some recognition. She's got, she got a medal from the United States. Oh, good on her. Uh, yeah. But I don't know if Biden will be aware of that. No. But if well, you're watching... Then um, M- M- Maureen Sweeney, Black Sod Weather Station, Ballinar. Lovely. Great. Ballinar. Ballinar. Yeah, not ballerina. Ballerina. No, no. A ballerina. Uh, thank you both. We'll catch up with you a little thank bit later.